Okay, well, like everyone, I want to thank um, Chris and Peter and the ITAM folks here for organizing this workshop. It's, it's a real pleasure to come. And I'm going to talk about our, our efforts on quantum simulation with 2D arrays of hundreds of trapped ions, and this is in a penning trap. Uh, this is a cartoon sketch of our penning trap. In this trap, which we just do Doppler laser cooling, no sideband cooling, uh, we can adjust the radial confinement to be weak compared to the axial confinement, and then we can form a single plane of ions as shown here, and then looking down on that plane, this crystal's rotating, but we can use time-resolved imaging techniques to take an image of the ions in, in the rotating frame, and you see that we get a 2D triangular lattice. Each dot here is the fluorescence from an individual beryllium mine, and the spacing is about 20, 20 microns. Um, so I, I'm going to be talking about work which was done by two postdocs, Joe Britton and Brian Sawyer, and their work builds on previous work by Michael Biersick and Herman Ace, and uh, it's a pleasure to acknowledge lots of good theory support from the Freerix group at Georgetown, Anna Marie Ray's group, and Dan Dubin, who's a plasma physicist at the University of California at San Diego. And then also at NIST, um, you know, there's the great advantage of having lots of good long-term collaborators. So uh, I'm not going <coughs> to give any motivation for quantum simulation. Phil did that a little bit in the last talk. I'm going to jump in and say something about penning traps because I think most people here understand RF traps really well, but the penning traps not quite as well. The name of the game with trapped ions is to use spin-dependent forces. This engineers tunable Ising interactions. I'll say how we implement those spin-dependent forces. Um, these spin-dependent forces, uh, in, in addition to generating tunable spin-spin interactions, one can get spin-motion entanglement. And generally, we want to avoid that. But that's a useful metrology tool for us, so I'm going to talk about that a bit. And then how we benchmark the interactions, where we're going in the future. So starting with the brief description of the penny traps, I think everyone here knows how an RF trap works, a linear RF trap. You're building a structure that uh, generates a force that has a non-zero divergence. And so in the linear RF trap, there are electric fields that confine the ions along the axis of the trap. And then there's the ponder motive force due to the inhomogeneous RF fields that gives the radial confinement. Um, so you might say, well, the ponder motive force is not a real force, but my claim would be that this trap works because of conservation of energy. If you have a particle down in the center of the trap, you need to give it some energy for it to escape the trap. So contrast that with the penny trap, which uses static electric and magnetic fields for confinement, just like this linear RF trap. We use electric fields to plug the end caps of the trap. This, these electric fields are typically generated by a stack of cylinders. Um, so once again, the axial confinement really is conservation of energy. However, the radial confinement is something different because it really isn't a force pointing radially inward. It can't be conservation of energy because ions have lower energy out here at the ends of the trap. Now, Dan Dubin and Tom O'Neill have shown that one, that, that one can Think of the radial confinement as due to another constraint. It's conservation of angular momentum about the symmetry axis of the trap. So we pay attention to building these traps as symmetric as we can. Um, more practically and less abstract, I think it's useful to think about the confinement in a penning trap as the ions naturally want to rotate in this trap. There's this axial magnetic field, there's a radial electric field which is pointing radially outward, and that gives rise to an E cross B drift. And if you go into the frame rotating with the ions, they're rotating through the magnetic field, and in that rotating frame, that generates a V cross B induced electric field which is pointing radially inward. So this rotation, takes a trapping potential which is radially deconfining in the lab frame and it turns it into a radially confining potential in the rotating frame. So here, omega c is the cyclotron frequency and omega r is the rotation frequency. 
So this rotation frequency that I'm talking about really becomes a parameter in the track. Uh, it's something that's determined by the angular momentum or it's something that we tr try to control. And so this shows the density and different cloud shapes we get as a function of the rotation frequency starting at very low rotation frequencies. There's a minimum ro rotation frequency which is a single particle magnetron frequency. In any case, for very low rotation frequencies, we have a weak radial confinement, we get pancake-shaped clouds, we can spin up the cloud and get 3D plasma shapes. And this gives some characteristic frequencies for our work. We use beryllium ions of 4.5 Tesla, and so that's a cyclotron frequency of about 7.5 megahertz. Our axial confinement is characterized by a center mass frequency close to a megahertz. And, um, this is a single particle magnetron frequency. Probably it would be better to quote what's this effective binding in, 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 in the rotating frame. And that's for, for these single plane regions, that's typically around 200 kilohertz for us. Um, so just a picture <coughs> of a trap, of, of the penning trap we've been using for many years now at NIST. The thing to point out is this is a huge trap. The distance from the ions to the walls is two centimeters. So it's an order of magnitude larger than most RF traps. Um, this sits in the room temperature bore of a superconducting magnet, so it's a room temperature system. Uh, we try to get a good background pressure of in the mid times 10, 10 to minus 11 torr. Um, so I, I, um, this is something Jake touched a little bit about on, on in, in the opening talk of this meeting. Um, we can work with large numbers of ions in a penning trap more easily, I think, than in an RF trap. And uh, here I have to give credit to Michael Drusen and other people in here who have shown that you certainly can work hard and laser cool tens of thousands of ions in um, RF traps. But this is just easier in a penning trap. And probably one, one example I can give to try to convince you of this is this work from this plasma physics group at the University of California at San Diego where they use Doppler laser cooling to vary the temperature of greater than 100 million magnesium ions in their, in their penning trap. Um, so the type of crystals that form in this trap depend on the shape. If we're uh, in a 3D plasma shape and the cloud is large enough, we get body center cubic crystals. Um, if we go to this planar regime, we get a triangular lattice, as I showed in the first slide. And uh, just review some features of penny traps for quantum information. Because we use static trapping fields, um, it's easier to generate large voltages with static fields than with our fields. So one can build a large trap and still have a reasonable confining frequency. The ions are far from the trap electrodes. That should give us low heating rates. Uh, we can form 2D and 3D crystals. Uh, this triangular lattice is interesting for magnetically frustrated simulations. Um, I'm not aware of lots of penny trap efforts. I know there's one at Imperial College which is focusing on small numbers of ions and Michael Biersick's building one that's using, where, where he plans to use brilliant ions and laser cooling as well. One feature that's maybe not desirable, but we have to live with is that these ion crystals rotate, but we can, we can control the rotation very well. And so that makes, uh, that, that, that makes detecting individual particles or, or spins possible. And so I thought I'd say something about this rotating wall technique because it's very important in our work. So it's implemented in our present trap with six azimuthally segmented electrodes which lie outside the main cylinders. And then we apply sinusoidal voltages with different phases to these six different azimuthal sectors. And that generates a quadruple field, has potential x squared minus y squared. But then we make that rotate, or, or that naturally rotates, at half the drive frequency that we're putting on each uh, each, each, each of the segmented electrodes. And so what this rotating quadrupole potential does is it takes the boundary of our cloud, which is normally circular, and it squeezes it, 
and then that rotating boundary necessarily rotates at the rotating wall frequency. And so that distorts the boundary to being elliptical, and this then applies a torque that tends to drive the rotation frequency of the cloud or the crystal to equal the rotating wall frequency. And so this works very well for our low temperature for, for, for our crystals. So I'm going to show here a video where we're looking at a side view image of a cloud where the rotation frequency is around 60 kilohertz, and then we adiabatically ramp this, this rotating wall frequency down to where we get a single plane. So we're adiabatically rotating the frequency down. The crystal shape is following. We go to three planes, two planes, eventually a single plane. And then when we reach that single plane regime, we can use an imaging photomultiplier tube and get an image of the crystal in the rotating frame. Okay. So um, I, I should mention that while, while we can do this individual particle detection, it, it does take some time. So the experiments I'm going to show you are all using global fluorescence. <coughs> so we, we've heard about that the modes are um, important for quantum simulation, because one, one can think of the modes as transmitting the information, so I thought I'd say something about the modes of these single-plane crystals. Um, if they're n-ions, they're three n modes, and for us, those modes separate into three different bands. There's n transverse modes, and by transverse modes, I mean oscillation, which is perpendicular to the plane of the crystal. And then there's two n in-plane modes, which separate into high-frequency cyclotron modes and low-frequency E cross B modes. And in our work, uh, we use spin-dependent forces to couple to these transverse drumhead modes. Um, thanks to the Freerix group, we have a code where, where we can calculate these modes. And here's a calculation of the frequencies of some of the higher frequency modes and then the eigen modes or the eigenvectors of some of the higher frequency modes. So, so the highest frequency mode is the center mass mode, and then the next lower frequency modes are the tilt modes. And in general, uh, as the wavelength of the modes gets shorter, the frequency decreases. Um, we can contrast this with the linear string of ions where one gets a similar ordering for the transverse modes. Shorter wavelength, is sh uh, shorter wavelength gives rise to lower frequency. Interestingly, we get the biggest gap between the tilt mode and the center mass mode. Well, that's the smallest gap in the linear string. So th there are some quantitative differences. Um, this is a, show, shows a calculation of the uh, uh, eight highest frequency drum head modes and then the two lowest frequency drum head modes for single plane crystals of 331 ions. And we can, using a spin motion entanglement t technique, we can detect these modes. And um, this, this is just an advertisement for something I'm going to talk about later. So at high magnetic field, what do we use as our effective spin? Let's say a little bit about this. Um, beryllium has a single valence electron. And in the high magnetic field, the qubit we use is the electron spin flip transition of this valence electron. There's also nuclear spin, which is fairly well decoupled from the electron spin. We optically pump that nuclear spin, and so I'm just ignoring it in this diagram. So our qubit frequency, this electron spin flip frequency in 4.5 tesla is 124 gigahertz. Uh, we, um, oops. we can have the, the upper state is a bright state in the Doppler cooling laser beam, and then we can efficiently prepare the spin-up state by optical pumping techniques. And then we use microwaves at 124 gigahertz to do global rotations of our qubit. Um, so this shows some Robbie flopping data where we start with all the ions and spin up and drive them to spin down in 70 microseconds. This is using a 150 milliwatt source at 124 gigahertz. Uh, 
Recently, we've uh, done some better coupling of the microwaves and gotten this down to about uh, 10 microseconds. And then more important is what's our T2 coherence time because our qubit linearly depends on the magnetic field. So we're sensitive to magnetic field fluctuations. And we measure our, our co coherence time using this spin echo technique uh, where by varying the phase of this last pi over 2 pulse, uh, we can measure um, phase flopping fringes. And for short times, we have full contrast. And then as that time increases, the contrast goes down. So this shows a, a series of phase flopping envelopes at different stages of this work. And our current coherence time is around 50 milliseconds. Um, so when, uh, just briefly, and you can talk about this, talk, talk about this to me later if this is interesting. Here we were limited by magnetic field fluctuations of the homogeneous field of the magnet, which is due to vibrations. We set the magnet on some vibration isolation pads, and that got us out to this blue curve. And then we found out we were limited by a phase noise in our lock on the 124 gigahertz. And by going to this new amplifier multiplier chain, we could get out to, 100, uh, to, to, to roughly 50 milliseconds. Um, we're in the process of moving our lab. And when we set up the new lab, we're, we're, we're going to set the magnet on a laser table, which will give us better vi vibration isolation. And so we'll see if that improves our co coherence time. This, this is a theoretical calculation of what we could get based on the 100 megahertz oscillator, which is giving us the phase reference for our, our, our 124 gigahertz source. So how do we implement spin-dependent forces? Um, we use optical dipole forces from off-resonant laser beams. So it's not the malmer sorensen technique, but the, we like to call it the D.D. Lightfried te technique. Uh, um, so we, we um, um, use a laser or, or two laser beams that cross at a shallow angle of about five degrees. These laser beams are detuned by about 20 gigahertz for any resonant op, uh, um, dipole tran trans transitions. Um, these two laser beams, if they're the same frequency, would generate a standing wave, and the wavelength of that standing wave at the shallow angle is four microns. Of course, the technique here, we put them at different frequencies, and so this is a moving standing wave. And as these wave fronts wash over the single plane of ions, that generates a time-dependent force. And we can adjust the frequency and polarization of these beams so that the force and spin up is equal and opposite to the force and spin down. Um, the alignment of these wave fronts with the laser beam is critical, and so we've developed ways to do that. And this is just to emphasize that we're taking techniques that were developed 10 years ago and work well with small numbers of ions in RF trap and, and, and trying to apply that um, to hundreds of ions in a penning trap. So just briefly, uh, this is following work of people, um, some of who are in the audience here. Formally, we're setting up an interaction where we're globally coupling the axial coordinate of each ion with the spin degree of freedom. And then you can plug in a normal mode expansion in terms of the drumhead modes for that axial degree of freedom, solve for the evolution operator, and you get two terms. You get a term which is linear in the spin degrees of freedom and a term which is quadratic. This term which is linear in the spin degree of freedom um, couples the spins to the modes, to the drumhead modes of our system. And so this gives rise to spin motion entanglement. And this is the dominant term when an, our optical dipole force beat note lies close to any of the mode frequencies. Um, generally speaking, for quantum simulation, that's what you want to avoid. And this is the term which can be the dominant term for large detunings of the optical dipole force beat note to any modes. And uh, this is an expression uh, 
that Phil showed in his talk with slightly different parameters out here, where if we know the modes of our system and the frequency of our optical dipole force speed note, we can calculate these pairwise coefficients. So I'd, I'd like to say a little bit about how we use the spin motion entanglement term to learn something about the drum head modes. And I'll start this section by talking about a very simple example where it's just a single ion, and I'm thinking of a single trapped ion or, you know, effective spin one half, which is uh, in a trap, so it's characterized by some initial harmonic oscillator motional state, and we're doing a Ramsey experiment on the effective spin where we apply an optical dipole for uh, a, a spin-dependent optical dipole force between these two Ramsey pulses. So the first pi over two pulse just flips the spin by 90 degrees, and then the spin-dependent optical dipole force displaces the spin-up state in a different direction than the spin-down state, so we get entanglement of the spin and motional degrees of freedom, and then this final pi over two pulse turns uh, our spin-up state into up plus down, and the down state into minus up plus down, and you can see that if these states were the same state, the spin-up amplitude would go to zero, but in general, because these states are now not the same state, the, the, the motional state associated with spin up and spin down, um, that we will get some population in spin up state. And so effectively, what we're doing is the block vector has gotten shorter because of decoherence due to entanglement of the spin and motional degrees of freedom. Now, how do we use this for metrology? Well, we use this for metrology is that even though this displacement is independent of the initial state, this overlap integral does depend on in the initial state. And in general, um, there's enhanced sensitivity to displacements as the energy of this initial state um, goes, goes up. And this enhancement of uh, higher energy states to displacements can be qualitatively understood in terms of this Fox state, in, in terms of this picture of different Fox states. And so if we think of taking a Fox state of a harmonic oscillator, splitting the wave function, and, and displacing uh, the spin down state in one direction, the spin up state in a different direction, and then calculating this overlap integral, you can see that as we go to higher end Fox states, they're more sensitive to displacement. And, you know, that's, that's fairly clear from, from, from the fact that these oscillations are shorter wavelength than this ground state wave function size. So <clears throat> going from this example now to um, measurements where we're doing now sweeping, uh, rather than using a simple Ramsey technique, we use this spin echo technique. And then this shows data uh, where we're measuring the population in spin up uh, at the end of the sequence uh, as we sweep the optical dipole force across the center mass mode for several hundred ions. And this line shape we can understand in terms of these phase space pictures. I'm not going to talk about that except to say right on resonance, the spin motion entanglement we generate in this first free precession period gets unentangled in that second period. So that gives rise to this dip. So we can superimpose in this curve different calculations of the signal we expect, assuming a thermal distribution corresponding to different temperatures. And this shows that this curve contains temperature information and that our center mass mode was characterized, in this case, by a temperature about two and a half millikelvin. Um, one thing I'd like to emphasize is we're making very small displacements here. This um, signal which we're, we're seeing here, we're applying a spin-dependent displacement on many spin states, but the RMS value of, those, of, that, of, of the amount that we're actually displacing the spin states is less than one nanometer. And just 
to give that a little context, um, if we compare that to the, to the thermal spread of an individual ion, that's roughly 250 nanometers in our experiment, and compared to the ground state wave function size of the center mass mode, which is about three nanometers. So is this basically at the Doppler limit? Uh, the, the, I'll, I'll get to that in one sense. This, this, is, this, this is a little bit above the Doppler limit. The limit I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. So we can now broaden the sweep and start a little bit above the center mass mode and now sweep down to lower frequencies. We see the uh, spin motion entanglement with the center mass mode, then with the two tilt modes, and then with the shorter wavelength modes, and we start to lose resolution. And here we compare this with the theoretical calculation uh, where we assume 0.43 millikelvin, which is the Doppler laser cooling limit for all the internal modes, and in this case, 5 millikelvin for the center mass mode. So this is telling us that our center mass mode is hotter than the other modes, which are consistent with the Doppler cooling limit. We understand this now is the way we were doing the Doppler laser cooling. The radiation pressure was offsetting the center mass mode from the center of the trap by around 10 nanometers, and we were turning that off non-adiabatically. And so by turning that off adiabatically, we've been able to re reduce the temperature of the center mass mode to close to the Doppler cooling limit. Um, by doing uh, broad sweeps down to DC, we can measure the bandwidth of these modes, and we do this here as we vary the radial confinement. And so as we uh, increase the radial confinement, um, which corresponds to larger ro ro rotation frequency, we can push this lowest frequency mode down closer to DC. As we lower the rotation frequency, we get a narrower bandwidth to modes. The blue curve here is a histogram of, of, of modes based on the Friedrichs code, and we see good qualitative agreement with that. The other point I'd like to make is um, these uh, lower frequency modes are all the short wavelength modes, and we can couple to those modes even though we're using a uniform spin-dependent force. So um, at, at, at meetings I've gone to where there's RF ion trappers, it seems what generates the most discussion is heating rates. So I thought I'd have to show a heating rate now, now that we can measure a mode resolved temperature. And so here I show uh, a heating rate of our center mass mode. The first time we did this, that's the black curve, and we see uh, 14,000 quanta per second where we're, we're at a relatively, uh, you know, a little bit lower frequency. But we weren't doing any filtering on our trap electrodes, and so we put filters now on the outside of the vacuum system. And here are two different measurements done in two different clouds in different days. And we get a heating rate here on the order of 500 to 1,000 quanta per second. So that's not bad, but given the size of this trap, you might expect it should be a lot lower. Um, so, this right? No, this is room temperature. So, uh, but, but you're getting at probably, uh, we, we, we think that this method that we're using to measure the heating rate is sensitive to heating due to background gas collisions, and a heating rate of about 1,000 quanta a second, we believe, is consistent with background gas collisions. So that might be what we're measuring here. So how much, how am I doing for time? Total 10 minutes. Okay, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll close by talking about a mean field spin precession measurement we did, which, which is a first order benchmarking of the uh, pairwise Ising interactions. And so um, just to review, um, these Ising coupling coefficients can be calculated if you know the eigenvectors and, and uh, the eigenfrequencies. We always think of doing a positive detuning of our optical dipole force beat note relative to all the modes. And um, here's a calculation of the different pairwise Ising coupling coefficients as a function of separation. This is done for a cloud of 200 and some ions, I forget. 
Anyways, um, as, as one changes this detuning from very small detunings to large detunings, one goes from interactions where there's no dependence on distance to interactions where um, the strength falls off as roughly 1 over d cubed. And so this is the, um, uh, this Phil showed in his talk, is that these Ising coupling coefficients have an approximate power law dependence on distance. Uh, but, well, let, let me back up a little bit. But for our system where we have lots of modes, it's not as well characterized as the linear strings, can we really trust this formula? Um, one would like to benchmark the interactions. So we've, we've done a first order benchmarking using mean field theory. And mean field theory ignores quantum correlation, so it's really the classical limit of this Hamiltonian. And one can readily show that the mean field limit um, of this Hamiltonian can be written like this. And this has a simple interpretation where um, each spin sees an effective magnetic field due to its interaction with all the other spins. And that magnetic field is given by the pairwise coupling coefficient times the z component of the spin. If all the spins are pointing in the same direction and angle theta from the z axis, that's just cosine theta. So I'm going to describe to you an experiment where we do global fluorescence measurements. And so we end up being sensitive to the um, um, mean field spin precession, which is averaged over all the ions. And um, one characteristic of this mean field spin precession is it depends on the angle the spins make with the z-axis. So the mean field spin precession is in one direction in the northern hemisphere, the opposite direction in the southern hemisphere. And so we can measure mean field spin precession and separate it from normal Larmor precession using a spin echo technique. And this shows data where we see spin precession in one direction in the northern hemisphere, the opposite direction in the southern hemisphere. We fit this curve and extract a value for the mean pairwise coupling coefficient. We can separately measure and calibrate our laser intensity. And then here we make a plot of this mean field of coupling coefficient as a function of the detuning from the center mass mode. And the points are experimental measurements. The red is a theoretical calculation. And so at this classical level, at least, we're getting good agreement um, with, the, with the strength of the mean field coupling parameter with what one expects from this, from this theory. So what's next? Well, we'd like to benchmark this system um, at a higher level, it would be nice to benchmark quantum effects. And thanks to some theoretical work, that's possible. Uh, in particular, Michael Kastner and then also uh, Michael Fosfeig, who's here, have done some calculations uh, that show uh, that, that, that if you do a quantum quench, and, and so the, the quantum quench I'm talking about here is uh, if you put the spins along the x-axis, which is the transverse um, to the Ising interaction, and then suddenly turn on the Ising interaction. And then one can calculate the depolarizations of the spins and the second order um, spin cor cor correlations. And so we've, we've started looking at this, but our system isn't clean enough yet to, do, to, to measure these quantum effects. And one of the reasons it isn't clean enough is because of spontaneous emission. And so we're in the process of increasing the angle which these two laser beams cross at, which generate the optic, optical dipole force, by a factor of seven. Um, and this should increase the ratio of our coherent interaction strength to spontaneous emission by seven squared, or 50. And in order to do this, we have to build a new trap. And so we're in the process of assembling this trap. Um, one feature of this trap that we're going to implement is we're going to have a larger number of rotating, rotating wall electrodes so that we can implement an M equals 3 rotating wall. 
And so one, if, if, if this works, this would be nice because in, in our present system, we have a triangular lattice in the center of the plane, and then we have a boundary which is elliptical. And so as you go from that M equals 3 symmetry to a different symmetry on the boundary, there are necessarily crystal defects. And so here we can match the boundary. I have to press this thing pretty hard. Here we can match the boundary with the underlying crystal symmetry and make more perfect crystals. So we'll have to see how well this works. Um, so, and I'll close, I think my time's up, just by uh, showing the guys who did all the work, Joe Britton and Brian Sawyer. And Adam is a grad student at the University of Colorado, but worked for Jim on this code, which calculates the modes of our planar crystals. So thank you. about the, the heating rates of your other emotional modes? So we, we haven't looked at that. So um, that, that's a good question. If, if, if they were the same as the center mass mode, then you might think it's background gas heating, because right. that should be democratic in heating exactly. all, 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 all the modes. So that's, that's a, good, um, it's a good comment. And, and uh, if I may follow up on that, uh, do you think you can make superpositions of your emotional modes? Can we make superpositions of our emotional modes? Like the, the beautiful work that Dee Dee and Dave did a long time ago with um, squeeze states of emotional states of ions. So, so let, let me emphasize again, we're starting with thermal states where the n bar is around 10. Now, we, at some point in this experiment, we would like to implement a subdoppler cooling. I don't, um, I don't really dream of getting to the ground state, but it'd be nice to take our mean phonon number per mode, which is close to 10 now, and get it down to one or two. Um, so if it's, if it's possible to make these superposition states where you don't start with a good ground state, maybe that's something we can do. But I, I, I certainly haven't thought about that. Thank you. Yeah. I'm wondering if the rotating wall potential, which you need to keep track of your eyes, of course, uh, can heat the E cross B modes and result in the overall higher temperature. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, so one form of heating um, is, you, you know, I talked about that, that, that in a penning trap, there's a, a, axial symmetry is something that we pay, pay attention to. And you might take the point of view, you, you know, the reason being because you want angular momentum to be, be conserved. But you could take the point of view, well, with the rotating wall, we can put in angular, angular momentum, which ambient torques due to trap asymmetries might be taking out. But um, you, you can make some, some general arguments that the, ro that, that, that the rotating wall is going to do work. And the work it does is the torque it has to apply to keep the rotation frequency constant. So it can be a source of energy input. Um, so is there a coupling between this in plane modes and the out of plane modes that would result in decoherence? At, at, um, at, at, at some level, I'm sure there is, but I, I don't know what that, what that is. Um, I, I, I should say that in a, in a different configuration, in a 3D plasma shape, back in 2004, we measured the, the um, a torque that the rotating wall has to apply in order to keep the rotation frequency constant and calculated the energy increase that was putting in. And it was smaller than background gas collisions. But I, I hesitate to take that result, which is on a different configuration, and immediately apply it to our single plane. Okay, well, but um, thanks, John.